Er was een verhaal wat zij hield over uh, neurosciences en de ontwikkelingen op verschillende terreinen die ze in de wereld tegenkwam. Ze is daar de hele wereld voor overgevlogen om de laatste ontwikkeling in kaart te brengen en heeft daar een boek over geschreven. De vijfde revolutie. Na haar verhaal had ik ook nog de mazzel om naar haar hand even met haar te kletsen. En het blijkt ook nog een geweldig mensen zijn, dus ik kwam stuiterend die zaal uit. En ik heb er nog even een paar weken op kunnen kouden. ...over wat zij me allemaal te melden had. Ik heb uh, tijdens de vakantie echt de tijd genomen om het boek door te kouwen. En nou ja, dat was inderdaad zo'n ontzettende eye-opener. Dus toen ik met John en Maarten en Karel in bespreking zat... ...van we mogen één keer per jaar een internationale spreker naar Nederland halen... ...ja, toen wist ik het al gelijk. Een dik, vet pleidooi voor Lone Frank... En ik hoop uh, dat zij uh, jullie net zo kan inspireren als, uh, als mij. En dat heeft ze in ieder geval gedaan. Ze heeft nog een boek geschreven over de genetische informatie. En we hadden tijdens het diner hier aan voorafgaand al een beetje ruzie over wie het exemplaar gaat krijgen. Nou, dat ben ik natuurlijk, dat snappen jullie. En ik wil heel graag een applaus voor, de, voor Lone Frank. Oh, 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 één ding. Sorry, sorry. I just forget about to say one more thing. Uh, als jullie wat willen weten of een vraag willen stellen aan Lone Frank, meld dat even op hashtag netwerk023 via Twitter en dan houden we de vragen in de gaten. Well, thank you very much for what I'm sure was a very nice introduction. <laughs> And thank you, Alke, for, for getting me here. Um, I almost feel like Holland is, is my sort of my second homeland. I've been here two weeks ago and I was here, you know, uh, a couple months ago. Um, so it's, uh, I ought to start learning the language, I guess. Anyway, I was, um, I was asked to come here uh, by John and talk about neuromarketing. And, and I will, but a little later, because there's something more important first, I think. And, and that is uh, what I would call the, the fifth revolution, really. Uh, what we're living through is, is a neuro revolution, and I'll come back to that. Um, actually, One really nice sign of the neuro revolution, the sort of first sign I got of that was many years ago, I was sitting in, um, in the airport in Amsterdam. It was one of my first trips here. And I couldn't get out of the airport because my plane back to Copenhagen was delayed. And what can you do in an airport? You sit there and you look around and there are all these giant signs from ING saying um, it was their slogan at the time. They said, start something new, you owe it to your brain. Which I thought was a weird slogan. You owe it to your brain. You know, five years before that, you would have said, you owe it to yourself. And you can now go on Yahoo Finance, if you want to you know, check the, um, the stock prices. Uh, you can go on Yahoo Finance and you can see headlines saying, for example, you know, if you can't save up, Blame your brain. So it's like everything that we used to call the self or the spirit or the soul is now the brain. Everything is kind of anchored in that, you know, three pounds of wetware that we have between our ears. And I think that the sort of the essence of what you could call the neuro revolution is that we are coming to see ourselves in a different way. We are coming to see ourselves as You know, the best way to put it is what Francis Craig said, that we are all, each of us are a bag of neurons. I, kinda, I, I like that saying very much, a bag of neurons. And I know some people will say that that's horribly unromantic. And like one of my friends said, would you like people calling you a bag of neurons? And I'm like, yeah, if they don't call me an old bag of neurons, I'm fine. So I think that there is something great about looking at yourself as, you know, truly a biological system. Um, we are not what we used to think, you know, a biological being with something else, something, you know, fluffy, the soul, the spirit, whatever. We are truly, you know, biological beings. And the more that we know about this biology, the better it is, because the more degrees of freedom it gives us. And I think that is pretty much the essence of the neurorevolution. And I'll go through a little bit of the, um, of the science that sort of, because of course it is, the, it is discoveries from neuroscience that is sort of getting us there and that is you know, teaching us about human nature. We're not learning about human nature from religion. We're learning about it from neuroscience these days. I think one really nice place to sort of to start, and, and 
I think some arresting discoveries that are really sort of illustrative come out of the science uh, or the scientists who have been looking at moral sense. Because if you think about morality, you would usually, if you ask people, so where does morality come from? Where does your moral sense come from? And people will say, well, it's something that you learn, right? It's something that you're, you, know, you learn from your parents and from your teachers and whoever is around you, uh, what is good and what is bad. And if you go and ask developmental psychologists, they will say the same thing. You know, yeah, there are stages, you know, you, the, uh, a, a child will be born and it has no sort of, there's no moral encoded into biology, so we have to learn, you know, what's good and what's bad. Um, and we learn from parents and then from teachers and then from going out into society and get socialized and we come out at the end as sort of fully, you know, developed moral people. Well, it seems that that's not totally true. Of course, there are, you know, there are facets to morality that have to do with uh, being socialized and uh, cultural learning, of course, because we can see differences in different societies that, you know, some things are okay in one society, but they're not okay in, an in another society. But underneath all that, it does seem that there are sort of biological moral programs, if you want. And I'll just sort of sketch out um, how people have been looking at those and finding what they actually call a moral grammar that's ingrained into, into our brains, basically. So some of this research comes out of philosophy, because for philosophers, it has long been known that there are certain, there are certain sort of moral dilemmas that, that people have, they seem to have the same sort of intuition about how to choose in a certain moral dilemma. So everyone will kind of answer the same way. And philosophers have been discussing why is it that they answer this way, everybody, uh, and why uh, is it that it seems to be that there are sort of uh, things that don't really fit. I mean, it, it, it looks like weird rules that people are using uh, that don't follow stringent logic. Um, and then there are some brain scientists, some neuroscientists that have been starting to look into, well, what is the biology underneath this? Because, of course, if you say there is something that everyone in every culture seems to do the same way or feel about in the same way, then a biologist will tell you immediately, wow, there must be biology to this. Because if culture doesn't come into the equation, then it must be in, in your biology somewhere. There are some people at Harvard who have been looking into moral sense in uh, actually an interesting way. They've simply um, put out an internet test so that you can all go and be part of this research. And it's, it's, it's part of what I did uh, for my book was, you know, to go in and take that moral sense test, as it's called. And you basically click into the site, um, and tens of thousands of people have done this all over the world, so belonging to basically every culture, because it's out there in different languages. And, you know, different socioeconomic statuses and different ages and both genders and so on and so forth. And it sort of consists of I think it's 50 different dilemmas that you go through and you answer whether something, uh, whether some situation is morally defendable or not. And it seems that nine out of 10 people everywhere answer the same thing. Um, and to, um, to give you sort of a description of one is, uh, it's an old, old dilemma called uh, the train dilemma. And this is known to all the philosophers, and this is one of the things they've been discussing over and over. Why is it that people, you know, think what they think about the train dilemma? And the thing is, you go in there, and so you have to uh, imagine yourself standing on a little bridge, sort of a footbridge, and you're looking out over a terrain where, you know, there are tracks coming in uh, and trains going back and forth, and suddenly there is this, you know, this train you can see coming at you full speed. And you realize that there are five people hanging out of the windows shouting to you, help us, help us, for God's sake, because there's no one driving the train, uh, and they can't break it. Um, and actually, if it keeps on going, it will go under the bridge where you're standing, and it will go, it will go crashing down into a big hole. So you have to do something, and they're crying out for you to help them. And you can do something, because you have on the bridge a handle, and if you pull that handle, the, you will sort of sidetrack 
um, the train and it will go to a different track and it will stop there because somebody is sleeping on the track. So of course when it hits this guy and kills him, it will stop. So you're like, oh God. Um, and then you're asked of course to say, so is this morally defendable or is it not? And nine out of 10 people will say without thinking too much, yeah, of course this is morally defendable. Of course you have to do this because you're saving five people and you're just killing one. So that's four, kind of. <laughs> so you're four and plus, right? Okay, then you go on to the next dilemma, which is kind of the same thing. You're standing on this bridge, and you're looking out, and the train is coming toward you. Five people are screaming, shouting, you know, help us, help us, help us. And this time, you don't have a handle. There is no sidetrack. And the train is coming at you. It will go past you, and it, into the big hole, crash. Five people will die. But then, thank God, there is a very fat guy walking in front of you. And you can, of course, push the very fat guy down onto the track, and it will stop the train. And the same thing will happen. The guy will die, but the five people will survive. And so you're asked, is this morally defendable or not? And this time, um, nine out of 10 people will say, no, 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 you cannot do this. This is wrong, this is morally wrong. And that's where philosophers are like, but why? It's the same thing. You're still killing just one person, but you're saving five. So this is weird. And that's where the sort of the moral grammar comes in. That, that that's apparently a rule that people use. And the, the, the Harvard scientists have been trying to figure out, so they have asked people, hundreds of people, could you please explain to me why these two situations are different? And like the scientist I was talking to, called Mark Hauser, um, he said to me sort of, you know, what they come up with is a load of bullshit. Nobody can explain to me in a coherent way why they think that one situation is bad and the other is okay. But as he says, this just shows that, that there is a rule. There is something in our brain that is reacting to this and saying, well, this situation is just wrong. And he has other, he has sort of come up with, um, that he can detect in different situations and different moral dilemmas, he can detect, you know, four or five rules. Like this, he calls the contact rule. So it seems to, always be worse for us. We think it's worse to do something if we have physical contact with it. You know, it's worse to do harm if we have physical contact than if we just sort of, you know, touch a button or do something, you know, where we don't have that physical contact. And another rule is the activity rule, where it seems that people always think it's much worse to do harm to somebody else if they do it actively by doing something than if they do it passively. Uh, it's, it's sort of okay if you just, you know, turn around and you don't really see what's going on. Um, and I think that rule is very telling. And I think that is the rule that we, most people use when they think about euthanasia, for example. Because everywhere in the world, it's kind of okay to kill sick people in hospitals if they've asked for it. And, and you sort of do it passively. You just take out the tubes and you let them die of you know, not getting medication or not getting fluids or whatever it is. You're not doing it actively, so it's kind of okay. But you can't do it actively. If you go and actually give them you know, morphine or whatever, that's killing them. And people think that's just wrong. And I think that's the, <laughs> the activity rule that kicks in right there. Now, another group of scientists at Harvard were sort of looking into, so, it's fine to do, you know, internet testing on this. And, you know, you can see that there seems to be some rules, but let's, let's look at, so what happens in, in people's heads when this go on? And so what they did was basically the same thing. They just put their, um, their um, research objects, the people who were in the uh, research, they put them into an MRI scanner and asked them to, you know, read the same kind of dilemmas and, and you know, answer with the push of a button, whether it's morally defendable or not. And what they saw in the first dilemma was basically that when people were, you know, presented with the, they could, you know, pull the handle and they could sidetrack track the train, and they were asked, is that okay? And what went on was sort of, you know, rational thinking, sort of in frontal parts of the brain. It's, you know, where calculations go on. Um, so they calculated basically, yeah, that's okay, because, you know, you have four people uh, standing afterwards. Um, then in the next dilemma, what happened was that that sort of 
you know, rational thinking was kind of dampened because when they were thinking about it, they had to push this guy onto the tracks. What came on was a sort of strong emotional response from, you know, what we call the limbic system, the, um, you know, the reptile brain kind of, you know, emotional impulses that were just telling them, this is wrong. And those emotional impulses were much stronger than the calculations. And that's why it's, you know, that's what we feel when we, when we say we have a gut feeling. That's pretty much what, what is happening, that those emotional responses in the reptile brain telling us this is good or this is bad. And now you could, of course, say, well, why would it be revolutionary to know something like this? Well, I think it's very, very good to be able to think about your moral reasoning, because this is what we do all the time. We, you know, we have judgments about what is right, what is wrong. And if we, the more that we know about these programs that have sort of been ingrained into us, the more we can think about it from the outside. What you could call metacognition, really. I mean, you can start thinking about things with this knowledge that, oh, I may be feeling this now, but this is something that evolution has, you know, put into me. But this doesn't mean that it's right in some way. And I think this research also points to a really important thing that's happening in relation to, well, you know, rationality and emotion. Because when you think about it, we, we kind of, you know, see ourselves as very rational beings. We walk around every day, we think and we think and we have these big frontal lobes that, you know, we're the only animal with huge frontal lobes. And we think that we're using them all the time and that we're really thinking a lot and that we're, of course, making rational decisions. We're not emotional. Maybe our mother is emotional sometimes, but we're certainly not. I mean, we're rational. Um, but of course, it seems that um, <laughs> there, isn't, there is no sort of very, very rational um, human being. Well, yes, if, if you're autistic, you're much more rational than if you're not autistic, in fact. Um, because what is happening in our brains is the really if you look at evolution again, what came first in evolution was, of course, emotions. Because emotions are, like we see with the moral reasoning, they are really sort of very quick decision makers. You know, if you're an animal, you're out there, if you get scared, you know, you run, you don't think about it, should I run, should I not run, you, you just run. And if there's something that smells nice and like food, you go for it. And that's the kind of, you know, we still have those basic emotional drives. On top of that, we have, of course, developed big frontal lobes and, you know, rational thinking um, capacity. But still, there, is, um, there isn't one without the other. It seems that every kind of decision making has to have both elements. And you, you see it very clearly that you have certain patients, for example, that have, you know, uh, for some kind of, uh, for some reason, they have um, some kind of brain damage that has sort of disconnected sort of certain rational parts from the emotional brain. And what happens is that they simply cannot make decisions. There is a very, very famous uh, guy called, um, a patient called Elliot. If you've heard of Antonio Damasio, uh, who has done all this uh, basic research on emotions and decisions and sort of started this whole uh, new view of emotions. He had this patient called Elliot who had that kind of brain damage so that he couldn't sort of connect between rational areas and emotional areas. And he could sit in front of Dr. Damasio and Dr. Damasio would tell him, well, I'm going to put a red pen here and a blue pen here and you get to choose which one you want to, you know, write down this little story for me with. And poor Elliot was not, <laughs> he was just not capable of you know, making a decision. Which am I going to take? Which am I going to say? Because he didn't have his emotions telling his sort of, you know, rational centers that, you know, this is the kind of, this is the way you should go in. Because that is still what, what emotions are doing. They are sort of a basis for, okay, I'm leaning this way. I'm probably going to take the red pen. And then you can come in with your rationality and think, yeah, that's probably okay, or no, I'm probably going to go with the other one. Um, but you have to have that emotion in there to make any kind of good decision. It's interesting, though, 
um, when you go into decision or research into decision making, that there seems to be different kinds of decision where it's you know um, better or worse to use your sort of gut feelings or go with your emotions. Um, and there's a really interesting study that was done a few years ago where a group of scientists used um, two different sort of situations. They put their subjects in. They were, uh, on one hand, it was sort of small decisions. They had to go into a store and buy some kitchen utensils. Um, and they were presented with a choice. You can buy either this or that, or this one over here, and you, you know, think about it. There was a group uh, that had to, you know, really sit down and think about it and figure out what is the most rational choice for me, and then choose that kitchen utensil. And there's another group that was told, you just go in there and you take the one you sort of uh, immediately feel that you want. Okay. Uh, then there was another situation, people who were out buying a house, so a big decision. And there, again, uh, they were sort of asked to, you know, um, go with your emotions or sort of sit down and really try to calculate which is the better choice. And then they went back after, I think it was six months, and looked at these decisions again and asked people, so how satisfied are you with your choice? And it seemed, interestingly enough, that for the small choice, when it was about kitchen utensils, the best, the people who were most satisfied were the ones who actually sat down and thought about it. Like, yes, this is the one for my kitchen. I'll, I'll take this one. Whereas with the house, the really big decision, the, the group that sort of went with their gut feeling and didn't think too much about it uh, were the happiest with their choice. Which probably tells you that when you have something going on, a decision to make that's really big and there are, you know, tons of little things that figure into it, what your sort of emotional impulse comes up with is a big integration of, you know, from your subconscious has been working on this and sort of figured out, yeah, it's probably that house on the hill rather than the one down there in the valley. And that feeling is, you know, the better calculation than when you try with your big frontal lobes to sit there and calculate. So, emotions certainly um, have a place. Um, but it's interesting to think about, you know, yeah, they have a place sometimes and sometimes not. Um, because there is also, I mean, you can certainly meet a lot of people who have this um, sort of romantic um, relation to, to emotions and to feelings. Like, a lot of people will say, but you should just always go with your emotions. Well, not always. It, it really depends on what is the situation. Sometimes it's better to think, sometimes it's better to go with your emotions. Of course, the big challenge is to figure out exactly when do you do one and when do you do the other. But again, I think it's really good to be able to do that sort of metacognition. And the more you know about the processes that go into moral choices or other makings of decisions, the more you can sort of look at it from the outside and get better at it. Of course, another trend that sort of comes um, on the back of this is, is emotion regulation, um, which seems to be a very useful thing to be able to do. And again, that, that comes out of um, something quite different, it comes out of happiness research, which I think is interesting. Um, so we all know that we have sort of, or we have known for a while that people have like an, um, a sort of happiness set point. And you've probably heard all about this because uh, a lot of happiness research goes on in Holland, in fact. Um, so we have a um, happiness set point that we sort of fluctuate a little bit about. Like, of course, if we lose someone or if something bad happens, you know, it, you know our happiness goes down. But it's, it comes up. Even if really, really horrible things happen to people, that they break their back, they you know, uh, become paralyzed, after a while, some months, you will see that their happiness level is back up to what it typically was. Same thing if you win the lottery. It will take a few months, but then you will be back down to wherever it was that you were. And it used to be said that that is all sort of genetic. You can't do anything about it. It's just your happiness level is set, and that's it. Well, it seems that you can do something about it. Um, a guy 
Professor Richard Davidson, who works at the University of Madison in Wisconsin, has done an awful lot of research on this and has found out that that happiness set point, that sort of thermostat, is also you know, something you can read out of brain activity. Because it seems that if you measure your sort of resting activity, if you sit there and do nothing and just you know, measure your EEG, your, so your activity uh, in the brain. It seems that the more activity you have on the sort of left frontal parts compared to the right frontal parts, the better you're off, so the higher your happiness set point. And again, that seems to be pretty stable unless you work on it. And that's where the emotion regulation comes in. You can actually, if you use sort of cognitive techniques like traditional Buddhist meditation or mindfulness, for example. Uh, a lot of research has been done on this, but then you can change your happiness level up. I mean, not down, but up, which is, of course, where you want to go. Uh, and it seems to be kind of like um, a muscle, almost. You have to do this cognitive activity, and you sort of, you set that, um, you move the set point, and you, ha you create more activity on, in the left frontal parts of your brain. You don't, they don't know exactly how you do it, but it seems to be working, and that sort of concentration that goes into meditation helps uh, build some kind of you know, new highways in the brain and new connections and actually move activity to the left. And it also seems that from that sort of ability uh, to regulate your emotions, you become better at decision-making. It also seems something that you can use even in, in children, for example. There have been studies of children with um, you know, hyperactive kids with uh, ADHD, for example, that they can really benefit from um, learning to do mindfulness um, exercises. And they become much better at what they can't do, is concentrate and motivate themselves and, and so on. So it's all those sort of, with emotion regulation, you also train what you call your executive faculties. So for example, you become able to self-motivate much more um, and sort of plan what you want to do, what you don't want to do, and you become better or more satisfied with your own decision making. And of course, out of all this, uh, and there's much more research into this that, that you know, sort of underscores that brain revolution essence that, you know, you are this physiological system. And the more you look into it, one thing becomes very apparent is that it ushers in sort of a realization that what we used to call the self, and we used to have that, if you think about it, that kind of, you know, vision that there is an essential self in there. We all have like a self that is ours and that is sort of unassailable and that is just, you know, the way we are. That's not true, of course, because you mo the more you know about the brain as a very, very dynamic system, the more it becomes apparent that there is no true essential self. Your self at any moment is you know, the state your brain is in, of course. And if you think about it, we kind of all know that in a way. I mean, if you've ever had PMS, for example, you know that you have different cells in there. And <laughs> if you have taken antidepressant medications, you know that you can change yourself. Or if you've taken cocaine or whatever it is. You know, we really do change ourselves with changing our brains. And it can be done in different ways, of course. It can be done with drugs. Uh, it can be done with you know, m cognitive techniques like medication, uh, meditation or, or just you know, reading more books, doing a different kind of work. Um, I think the really sort of essential or important realization is that for each of us, there is no one true self that we should sort of be true to, like, oh, I am this way and I can't help it and, and you know, um, and this is the way I'm going to live. No, the more you know about yourself, and that means the more you know about your brain and its physiology and the way it's dynamic and the way it can be changed, the more you can decide who you want to be. And I think that is a really sort of um, deep realization that will seep into our culture, that the more we know about what we call human nature, the more we are able to transcend it in a way, the more we can decide who we want to be. 
I, sort of, it's, it's, I think it's been put very elegantly by um, a Danish writer for children called Thomas Winding, who said once that, you know, the greatest discovery a person can make is that you don't have to be who you are. And I think that's exactly right. You don't have to be who you are. You can change yourself. Especially if you know about how the brain works. You can really change yourself. And of course, uh, the sort of the other side of that you know, realization and, and, and what I would call the neuro revolution is that all these realizations and all, these, all this knowledge about the brain and how it's changed and how it works will of course seep into different sectors um, of, of society. Um, like we're already seeing it, we're talking about neuroeconomics, for example. So economists are starting to look at brains with scanners. Uh, and we're talking about neural leadership. So how do you lead people? How do you manage people by knowing about the brain, how it works? And of course, also neuromarketing, <laughs> which is what John is really interested in. And so I'll talk a little bit about neuromarketing. And of course, that is, um, it's a sort of very, very obvious thing. I mean, if you're working with trying to sell people things or ideas or whatever it is, um, you would like to sort of be able to test it out. So, you know, how do we know in advance that we're doing something right if we're trying to sell people something? Or you could say it's all about um, matching people up with the right products. And of course, well, I would say as a preface, in fact, because I'd like to sort of go into um, some, some interesting studies that have been done with neuromarketing. But before, I would like to say that you should always take these kinds of things with a grain of salt. Because when you talk about neuromarketing, is it, it is really a sort of a work in progress. It's a field that's very young, and it's sort of, it's more promising that it is actually delivering yet. But it has promise, and it is a growing field, and it might be sort of, whereas, you know, some people would say it's just sort of, you know, immoral to try to find, you know, a better way to sell things to people. Well, you, you might also turn it around and say, well, if it's something that could be used to actually develop better products that people would like, well, it might not be so bad. So it's what, of course, is the sort of the holy grail of neuromarketing is that you can get beyond the focus group, which, as you all know, focus groups have problems. You know, you can have weird group dynamics going on and things happening in the focus group, and you ask people stuff and they tell you something and it turns out not to be right for some reason. So focus groups are, are limited, right? So what you want is really to, you know, just put people in a scanner or, you know, give them some EEG equipment on their heads and just sort of read the truth in there somehow. So that's sort of, that's what neuromarketers really want. And you know, we go beyond what people think uh, they, you know, believe and, and really see what is the truth in there and what, what are they going to buy. And sort of the, the field had its, its birth, you could say, in, in 2004. Uh, what happened then was that a guy at Emory University called K Clinton Kilt uh, did an experiment where he, um, he was interested in, in people and their relations to brands. So he basically just took some people um, and, you know, took a lot of pictures of different brands, asked these people to rate these brands, so how, you know, how well do you like them on a scale from one to five or whatever, and he put them in a scanner as well and had them look at the pictures in there. And so what happened was that he could see something interesting. Whenever somebody looked at a brand that he or she really, really liked, something interesting happened. There was um, sort of great activity in an area of the brain, um, medial prefrontal cortex, that has to do with, um, or it, it's, it, it's active when you sort of think about yourself in a way and think about how you are and things that relate to you. So Kiltz thought that, well, if, if this is what happens when we sort of, I mean, this must be how we identify with brands, right? This sort of, this light that comes on in a certain brain region. So he and some other people did another experiment where they wanted to see, is, is this really, I mean, is this branding? Can we read branding in the brain? So what they did was they, um, they took the, what is called the, um, the Pepsi paradox 
which you probably know, that if most people taste Pepsi or Coke in a blind tasting, Pepsi will always win out. It's like 60 or 70 percent that will prefer Pepsi, uh, whereas uh, with the taste, only by the taste. But if you ask them, so would you like a Coke or a Pepsi, you know, many more people, I think it's probably 60 or 70 percent, would want the Coke. And they will tell you that it, it's because it tastes better. Well, in fact, it does, in a way. Because what they did was they put these people in a scanner, an MRI scanner, it's a big tube. And so they fed these people uh, Pepsi or Coke uh, with some very, very long straws that went all the way into the scanner. So they were lying there sort of sucking on these straws. Uh, and in the first test, um, they didn't know what was what. And what the researchers could see was that in the brain, yes, you know, for most people, um, some of these areas, like the ventral putamen, that has to do with, you know, do you like the taste of something? How rewarding is it? You know, Pepsi was way the winner. Tasted really good for people, probably because it has more sugar, and a lot of people actually do like a lot of sugar. Okay, the next round, same people. They were now told when they were sucking on their long straws, you are now getting Pepsi or you're now getting Coke. And what happened was that, you know, nothing especially happened when it was Pepsi. It was the same thing, you know, it tasted kind of okay. Um, but then what happened when it was, as soon as it was Coke, for most people, what came on was again that sort of medial prefrontal cortex, that sort of branding area, like, yeah, I like this. And then it sort of dampened down, um, or sort of, you no, know, it, um, it turned up the taste response. Like it actually, it's one area of the brain sort of tricking another area of the, of the brain, saying to it, this tastes really good because I like the brand of Coke. And suddenly it does taste better. So it's not just something that people will tell you, and you, you, you might think that, oh yeah, they just like the brand, so they would rather have something with you know, a Coke label on it, but they would still prefer another taste. No, it actually tastes better because they're getting tricked by their own brain. And that happens with other things too. Like um, there was a Danish experiment a few years ago where they took some people and they were looking at, at art. So they took some people and again put them in a scanner and they had a series of paintings that were done by an amateur painter. And they were, you know, shown all these paintings. And then when they were told that some of them were made, you know, by famous painters uh, and were, you know, just taken off the walls in a, you know, very known, uh, well-known Danish art museum, something happened. Like, people just simply liked it more. Suddenly the reward areas of the brain were much more active. Oh yeah, this is clearly so much better than the other pictures, definitely. And again, it is, it is the brain being told something and, you know, just tricking the rest of the system. The same thing happens with wine. If you take the same kind of white wine, put people in scanners, and uh, tell them that now you're getting a really expensive wine, it's the same as you had before, but now that you're told that it's very expensive, it tastes so much better. I mean, they will self-report that, yes, it tasted so much better. And you can also see it, again, in the reward system. Yeah, this is so good. <laughs> and so it's not just that we think uh, that, you know, yeah, people react to brands and it's just something that, you know, they would like to be seen with this brand. No, their brain actually likes it better for some reason. So this is, I mean, <laughs> if you want to brand something, that is where you want to hit sort of the medial prefrontal cortex, you know, and something will happen. Um, and there are other interesting experiments. Like there was actually one done, um, I think, in a, at a, um, it must have been at a Dutch university. Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, Erasmus University, somebody called El Smets, who was looking at trying to understand what is it that people get from, you know, celebrities. When you, can you sort of figure out, sometimes you pair celebrities with products, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And, and why is it that sometimes it doesn't work? Like Celine Dion was, I think, employed by a car manufacturer, and, and it just didn't work out at all, and they fired her pretty quickly. And that would be nice to know before you sign that million-dollar contract with a celebrity, that is it going to work or not? 
So what he did was, uh, this guy, he took 200, no, he took a group of women, put them in a scanner, and had them look at 200 different pictures with each a celebrity paired with some kind of product. Could be, you know, from coffee to watches to whatever, different celebrities. And then they, you know, looked at the brain scans. They came back, all the women, two days later, and they were sort of tested for how well did they remember the products. And also they were asked, so how, you know, how, how, how well do you like this product? So they rated every product. And what they could see was that what we sort of react to with celebrity seems to be not just celebrity, but you know, whether we think that celebrity is an expert on whatever it is this person is paired with. Because it seemed that people were, you know, they were self-reporting that they liked, you know, products like, for example, sports deodorant, if that was paired with Andre Agassi, for example. They didn't like, you know, um, Nescafe or other kinds of coffee when they were paired with the same celebrity. Because he's, I mean, Andre Agassi is not looked at as, you know, uh, an expert on coffee. Julia Roberts worked like a miracle for hair color. She didn't work for books at all. So, um, <laughs> so that tells you about, you know, you want to see a celebrity that sort of, that you can believe is an expert on whatever it is that, that this person is paired with. And you could also, when you went back and looked at the scans, you could see this in the brains of people. As soon as you saw those pairings where you had sort of some kind of expertise, you know, areas again in the reward um, system of the brain were lighting up. And it, all, what you also could see, which was interesting, was uh, because people were again tested for, did they actually remember these different products? And with 200 different uh, products and, and, and pictures, there were some that they remembered and some they didn't. But they could, from the old scans, they could see or predict which ones they would remember from what kind of activity turned up um, in a part that's called the hippocampus, a little area of the brain that has to do, or is central for learning and memory. And this is another thing that um, can be used, because this is, again, now we're getting at some place where you can ask questions that you can't ask people. I mean, you cannot call in people and say, you know, I'm now gonna show you a trailer for a movie. You tell me if you're gonna remember it uh, three months from now. Because that, if you look at the movie industry, that's what they usually do. They make a trailer, they show it to a focus group, um, but they can't ask them, the movie's coming out three months from now, but will you remember this, you know, seeing this trailer? They can only ask people, did you like it? And it's kind of, you can say, yeah, I liked it, or yeah, I didn't like it. Um, you can't really <laughs> say if you're gonna remember it. But what is happening now is that you have uh, neuromarketing products for the movie business. Because what you can do is you can call in people, put them in a scanner, and look at different ways of you know, editing um, a trailer, for example, and you can see which ones are really sort of you know, getting your hippocampus working. So this is probably what you will remember. So that is one sort of area we can, you can say there are already products out there in neuromarketing that are working. It seems that you can also, if you want to you know, go so far as to, can you predict what people will buy? I mean, again, that, that would be a nice thing. And it seems that, that you can in a way. I mean, there are people who have done experiments. Um, uh, there's a guy called Knudsen at Stanford who's doing a lot of neuromarketing experiments. And he's done experiments where, again, he had, he had different pictures of different products and prices. And people were just exposed to these pictures um, in a scanner, and then they were, um, they were to make the choice later whether would they, or they had to answer, so would you actually buy this product at this price? And they would press a button, yes or no. And of course, what, what happened, uh, they could actually, when they went back and looked at the scans, they could predict from the sort of integrated activity in three different brain areas what people would answer before they pressed the button. So you can sort of, you can get into that territory of can we actually look at people's brains and predict what they will do out there. 
What they're doing now is instead of just looking at, say, one picture, like one scan, and you have, so there's you know, activity over here, activity over here, and also over there, what they're trying to do in, in the sort of um, evolution of this technology is look over time. You know, put people in a scanner and have sort of a, you could call it a three-dimensional movie done of how is activity in their brain developing while they're, for example, uh, listening to a song. Because it seemed from an experiment done um, last year, I think it was, or it came out, no, it came out this year. What had been done was that um, some researchers had taken a group of people in 2008, they had exposed them to, in a scanner, um, some songs, some different songs. And they were asked, these people, so how well do you like this song? And they were rating these different songs. And then they looked at the sales activity of these different songs over the next three years. And what happened was that when they went back um, and looked at what had people answered, you know, how well had they rated these songs, that didn't predict what was selling in the market. But they could, from the brain activity, they could actually predict, oh, this is going to sell. Even if people at the time would say, oh, I don't like this song very much. But it seems that there is something going on that can apparently predict what people will do in sort of statistical way in the market. Um, and I think if you look at the future, to just sort of round this off, what um, will happen is that much more research will go into exactly that, trying to figure out you know, how are people interacting with products? How can we sort of look at, how can we see from their brain activity what they will actually like in a real life situation. And like some, kind of, some of the technologies they're working on is for example, uh, portable uh, EEG equipment that you can put on a consumer's head and send this consumer into say a supermarket or somewhere else and record from this and then go back and look at later. So what was the activity? And of course there's a camera too. So you know, what was the activity when this person saw this you know, box of soap and what later happened? Uh, and how do people react to these different goods in different contexts, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, there was actually uh, just in, in Denmark, this kind of um, equipment was just put out um, from the Technical University, and I know that some people at the um, uh, Copenhagen Business School are now working on it, and, and you know, sending people out in different contexts and seeing what can we learn from this. And of course, the other side of that is also, if you get this on equipment on consumers, if you learn about so what is happening uh, when they see this, when they do this, there's also the um, potential for, you could say, biofeedback. If people are looking at this and knowing about their brain activity in different you know, areas of the brain as they're going around and looking at these things, again, this is almost like metacognition. You can look at yourself from the outside, seeing, oh, this is actually what's going on. And you can maybe, I don't know, learn to you know, dampen your desire for soap boxes or whatever it is that you're going crazy on. So there's lots of interesting um, potential out there. Also for actually product development. If you go and read, you probably all, uh, all know Dan Ariely, who's an economist um, and very famous for his various books and studies and stuff. And he's written a lot about, uh, or some, about neuromarketing. And what he sees as the sort of you know, um, future is really product development with knowledge of neuroscience. For example, something like architecture. How are you going to design a building to be you know, the best possible building for whatever it's going to be used for? What you can do there is, some people are trying to look at, well, you can put people in scanners and give them a sort of virtual reality tour of different um, you know, ways of constructing this building. And for example, seeing like which designs are sort of overloading the hippocampus, for example. So which, which designs are you getting confused by? And avoid that, for example. And which do you sort of like more? I mean, which elicit positive uh, emotions when you walk around in this virtual reality. So there are tons of possibilities, I think, in this field. Uh, but again, it's only, you know, it started in 2004, and it, it's not been an area where there was a lot of public money for doing this. 
But I think that we will see in the future, uh, you know, public money going into looking at this because it's not only, you know, it's, it's not only great for marketing cigarettes or you know whatever products. It it could be great for you know changing people's minds about smoking cigarettes. You know, how do you figure out a campaign that can actually do that? or a campaign for you know, reading or whatever. So there are tons of interests in this. And it, I think it could be, if you look at it in the sort of the positive way of it's about creating the best possible products for people, I think that it, it, you know, it could be a field that in say 10 years, it won't be you know, that scary thing that it is now, that it will be a legitimate research field and it will perhaps, uh, or I think it will, aid in creating better products. So with that, I think I will just um, say thank you uh, that you would listen, and I hope that you have you know, uh, comments and questions and you know, 